Hey, good morning, Searchlight. Thank you so much for logging on to Church Online today. We are so glad you're here. My name is Tim. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm one of the pastors here at Searchlight, and I get the privilege of bringing you some announcements. First and foremost, we want to say thank you so much for being here. And if it's your first time with us, we want to invite you to check in so we know it's your first time. We'd like to know if we can do anything for you to help you take the next steps in your faith. But first, we have to know that you're here. So go ahead, take a second. Let us know it's your first time on our online connection card. If you click the link in the video description, I'll take you to our connection card. We can let us know as much information as you feel comfortable. Mainly, you can let us know if we can pray for you, or like I said, we can do anything to help you take next steps in your faith. If you're watching and you're a regular Searchlight attender, go ahead and fill out that connection card too. We want to know who's here so nobody falls through the cracks. You can also leave comments, like, comment, and share on this video to help it reach more people. That would be fantastic. Just a couple of quick announcements. The first and most important one is that life groups are starting up, some of them this week. And if you haven't signed up for a group, please head over to our website, searchlightchurch.com slash life groups. And that would uh, give you the opportunity to sign up. I think there are five groups still open. Three of them are closed. Uh, there's also Financial Peace, which is our, our financial Peace University, which is Dave's, Dave Ramsey's program to help you create a budget, help deal with debt. Uh, it's a special life group that we need to know how many people are in. It is $130 to buy the content, but actually if you complete Financial Peace University, we will reimburse you the cost of half. So if you make an investment in yourself, Searchlight will make an investment in you. If you'd like to sign up for that, like I said, head over to our website, searchlightchurch.com, click the Life Groups tab and sign up for a group today. Don't wait. Some of them are starting this week. Uh, go ahead and make sure with your Life Group leader. Uh, uh, when your group starts so you don't ever miss that. We're so excited about you guys getting out of rows and into circles. The other thing we just want to make you aware of is we are still meeting in person every Sunday at George Canterbone School, 240 Park Ave, every Sunday at 10 a.m. So come join us if you live local. We would love to see you in person. Uh, at this time, we're going to move into our time of giving. And so if you'd like to participate in that, you can do it a couple ways. You can fill out a check or money order and drop it in the mail and send it to our administrative offices, Searchlight Church and you'll see the address there below you. You can go online to our website, searchlightchurch.com, and give through, uh, securely through PayPal, or maybe the easiest way is to download the Tidely app where you can set up smart giving uh, from your phone or tablet. So we just wanna say thank you so much for supporting the work of uh, Searchlight Church in Long Branch and all around the world and being a part of what God is doing to bring hope to those who need it most. Let me pray for you guys and we'll move on with our service. So God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to hear from your word and be a part of reaching and teaching people to live in love like Jesus. Bless everyone within the sound of my voice, meet every need, and help us to be a blessing as we have been blessed. Now open our ears to receive everything you have for, uh, for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now go ahead and leave your three favorite emojis in the comments section and welcome Pastor Chris as he brings week five of our series, Are We There Yet? Good morning, everybody. How we doing? You guys good? Everybody's good? Who's going to win today? I don't know. Tony? I don't know. I don't care about football, but I'm going to be watching it. <clears throat> hey, welcome to Searchlight. If, uh, if, if this is your first time, we're glad that you're here. Thanks for being here. My name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor, and I get the privilege of sharing God's word today. Those of you that are watching online for the first time, thanks for joining us today. We're grateful that you're here. We are in week five of our six-week teaching series that we've been in called Are We There Yet? And uh, through the series, we're kind of looking at the life of a follower of Jesus and comparing it to a spiritual road trip. How many of you guys have been getting something out of it so far? And, um, and our desire has been that you know, th th to help us navigate the road trip. The truth is when you start your journey by following Jesus and accepting him into your heart, it's like you start on this road trip. It's like a lifelong journey that hopefully brings you uh, to look a lot more like Jesus towards the end of your life than the beginning of the journey. Amen? And so we're on this road trip, and uh, next Sunday, Pastor Tim's going to wrap it up with the last stop on the road trip. But then we got a lot of great stuff coming up over the next couple of weeks. Our key verse for this entire series has been 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. And I want to read it to you in the real version first. And then I'm going to share with you my adapted version for our, uh, for our road trip, okay? It says this. It says, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Now, I adapted this verse to make sense for our 
uh, road trip that we're on, right? And here's what it says in the Chris Coletti version, okay? Don't quote me or, you know, say that I'm blaspheming, okay? But I said it this way. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone drives, but only one person gets the prize. So drive to win. All drivers are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. And here's the big part, right, guys? I drive with purpose in every leg of the road trip. I'm not just taking practice laps. Really, this series is about driving our spiritual road trip with intention, with purpose, making sure that we're not just wandering around. How many of you guys get frustrated when you're lost in your car? Anybody? How many of you get frustrated when the person driving won't take directions from anyone? Anybody get frustrated? Only the wives? Okay, all right. Right? And so it's frust- as frustrating it is, it is to set out. Nobody sets out on a road trip and just says, we're just going to find out where we end up. We're going to drive for two hours, and we're just going to just be where we end up being. Right? We don't do that. And so spiritually, this, <laughs> this series is about being on a spiritual road trip and setting our coordinates, like driving with purpose in every lap, not just hoping we're going to end up somewhere better, but setting a purpose of where we're going to be instead of wandering through life, right? And there are three goals in this entire series, right, for you to find where you're parked. We talked about that in week one. Figure out where you're parked. Like, where are you on the spiritual road trip? Where are you spiritually in your life right now? Then determine your destination and set your GPS. Like, I don't want to be here in the beginning of 2025, right? I want to be in a different place spiritually. And so set your GPS. And lastly, put it in drive and take your foot off the brake. It doesn't matter how much planning you do. If you don't put some things into action, you're never going to get there. Amen? Yes, so each week we tried to identify different spots along the spiritual road trip so you can find yourself in one of these different places, and you can chart the place, of course, to your next destination. So we talked about new drivers, and there are some, some of us spiritually were like new drivers. Like we just started out on this spiritual road trip that every, every time someone raises their hand and says, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior, how many of you are glad about that, right? That's, such, that's a, such a great thing when that happens, and that is the beginning. They're like a new driver on the road trip. And then we, we talked about people that are a little further down the road, like first-time car owners, right? And all of the emotion, right, that comes with when you get that first car and you have freedom and you're excited, right? But how many of you know that emotion will only carry you so far, right? Eventually that car, your first car, is going to get old and you're going to start wanting a nicer car, nicer wheels and nicer stuff, right? And so emotions only take us so far. And then last week Tim did a great job talking about being kind of a fan of Jesus versus a disciple of Jesus, Kind of that in-between stage where we all get to that spot in our spiritual journey where we're like have one foot kind of we, we're like we're following. We like Jesus. We're a fan of him. We want salvation. We want all that stuff. But we also have one foot over here where, you know, like we we're kind of a fan, but we're not really a disciple yet or a follower. And Tim kind of talked about ways that we can truly buy in. Like if you are, are tired, remember he was up here on those two ladders. And the green one he borrowed from me. And I told him ahead of time, it's a fiberglass ladder and has a crack in the fiberglass. So I, when I use it, I'm careful. Don't get your body up on that <laughs> broken one. I told him. And what did he do? He went on the green. He went, the whole time I was praying, Lord Jesus, no accidents. But he was in between those ladders. Remember that? And he did get himself up on the green one. It, it was a miracle that nothing happened, right? But... So many times, right, we, we find ourselves in between. And we kind of, you know, we try to go higher with God, but it doesn't work that way. And he, he told us that it's important if, that if we want to get out of that stage of being an in-betweener, we got to be a servant and a student and a giver and a missionary. Different things, steps that we can take in our lives. So today I want to talk about the next phase in that road trip, and I would call it the experienced driver. There's a lot of people here spiritually that you've been in the Lord for a while. You're like an experienced driver. And uh, I'm going to talk about what that looks like and maybe some steps that you can take if you're like, I want to get there. I want to grow. I want to be more of an experienced driver. Before we go any further, though, let's pray. So I just invite you to uh, bow your heads with me, close your eyes for a moment. Lord, we're so grateful for your word. We're grateful that you love us. We're we're grateful for worship and your mercies that are new every morning. And so, Lord... Just open up our hearts and our minds today as we open up your word. 
And God, have your way in all of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So James, in his letter to the church, started it out in chapter 1 by saying this. James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. And the words are there uh, up on the screen for you if uh, you don't have your Bible or your smartphone. He said this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Okay, this is the picture of the experienced driver. What James was saying is that what takes you from being a new driver spiritually to an experienced driver on your spiritual road trip is all of the ups and downs of life. You get it? It's, it's all the trials. It's the difficulties. It's the things that you face that are going to help you to become an experienced driver. Now, if you're a new driver on the road trip, you're just getting started, and your experience with Christ is pretty cool, right? Even if you're like a first-time car owner, right, it's, or an in-betweener, it's like you're excited, you're full of hope, you're like experiencing new things and new people, and all of that emotion is there. But as your road trip continues, how many of you know you're going to face trials, Yes, you're going to face circumstances. You're going to face difficulties. It's not all easy. And that's when you become an experienced driver. You know, so many times we don't want to have the bad experiences. Right? How many of you enjoy trials? No? We don't enjoy it, right? We don't enjoy a flat tire. We don't enjoy getting laid off. We don't enjoy struggles in our relationships or things from our past that come back that we have to deal with. We don't enjoy those things. But how many of you know those are the places where we become experienced drivers? Yes? That's how you change. That's what James said. It's, these are the things that grow perseverance, right? There are some people. Now, uh, if you've been on the road a long time, you know that more experience as a driver doesn't exactly make you a better driver. In fact, there are some people driving cars today that have no business being on the road. They have, and if you're in, you live in, we live in New Jersey. We know most of them are here, okay? But if you're married to one of those people, shout amen right now. You're married to somebody who has no business driving a car, right? But for most of us, like the reality is for most of us, the more we drive, the more experienced and well-rounded we become, right? The more you drive, the more experienced you become. Let me ask you a couple questions. How many in this room, raise your hand, say, honestly, you have had at least one accident in your life? Wow. Okay. You know, Carl, I didn't ask that, okay? Let me ask this. Multiple accidents. How many people have had multiple accidents? Come on, put them up. Show us. Show us who's not driving the van with the teenagers. Okay. All right. All right, so here's the last question. How many of you experienced those accidents in the first five to seven years? How many of you had some of those accidents in the first five to seven years? You know, I have had a couple accidents in my lifetime. Most, all, most of them were in that the high school, college years, right? Because the, the statistically speaking, that's the true of most drivers. That's why insurance is more expensive when you're younger and it goes down the older you get, right? And one of the reasons that's true is because most inexperienced drivers lack a balanced approach to driving, right? You remember when you were young? You, had like a, you lacked a balanced approach, right? Like most young drivers are either drive too fast or too slow. But as you get older and more experienced, you know that there's a time to drive fast. There's a time to speed up, right? Like nothing annoys me more than someone who's trying to merge onto the highway and doesn't hit the gas. Does that frustrate anybody? Like I'm trying to get off and you're going to cause an accident because you need to go. Like hit the gas so I can get in there, right? There's a time to go fast, there's a times you have to speed up and times to slow down. Most young drivers are easily distracted. You remember when your music or your friends that were in the car, right? Or in today's day and age, we have phones and all this other stuff to distract us and kill us, right? How many young, uh, young drivers tend to make not so great decisions? You remember making bad decisions based on peer pressure, like who was in your car or if your friends would think, you know, what you were doing was cool. Or how about road rage? Anybody... Anybody have worse road rage now than you did when you were a teenager? I, I don't know. But, like, when you're a kid, it's just not there, right? But as we gain more experience, we get further down the road. Things tend to balance out. If you think about it, when you're a young driver on a spiritual road trip, like, there's all kinds of things that kind of take control. But as we grow, we, we, it should be that way that we balance out. And um, I, I've met brand-new believers, honestly, that are so on fire for Jesus 
that their whole they're like they're so out of balance in the way they behave. It's all good. I mean, they want to they love God and they want to tell everybody. But how many of you know those are the people that just tick off every single person in their family because they're so excited to tell them about Jesus. Anybody been there? They're like, please shut up. Like, can we have nobody? Can we have Thanksgiving dinner without hearing how thankful you are for everything that God has done for you? Right. And then what is it? They need to mature a little bit like they got. I'm not saying it's wrong. But how many of you know sometimes there's a window that opens for you to share your faith and then it closes up and that's balanced, right? Sometimes it's not the right time to tell somebody that Jesus has it all under control, right? Because they're just not going to hear it. But there may be a window when God opens up a window and they're ready to receive and a balanced Christian says, okay, now's a good time to put that in. And how many of you know sometimes the window closes, Right. And it's OK. Now's a bad time. But we come back tomorrow. There might be another open window. We get in there and we plant a seed. And so for our time together today, I want to explore what it looks like to be an experienced driver on the spiritual road trip and also what a church built on these principles looks like and how to grow in that way. Like if you see yourself in this spot or, you know, your next this is your next step on the road trip, like you're kind of a first time car owner or you're an in-betweener and you know that you want to get to that experienced driver then and and you want to set it in your GPS say like I want to get there I want to be different in 2024 then I'm going to help you see what your next steps are in your spiritual road trip right so if you're taking notes this morning and you want to follow along grab that note card and we're going to jump in this morning if you're watching online there's a digital version right there and uh, here's where we're going to jump off today and it looks like this an experienced driver on the spiritual road trip is a balanced believer. This, is, this should be the goal, right, in your walk with God, to, to grow in your experience with Christ, to become a balanced believer. Remember what James said? We just read it. He said, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be what? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's the goal, to be a balanced believer, mature and complete, right? And if we want to be in that place, That's what an experienced driver looks like. We need to strive to be balanced in our understanding of God's word, our identity in Christ, who he says we are, and our knowledge of his plans for our lives and and his will for our lives. So for the next few moments, I want to answer this question. It's your next fill-in. What does a balanced believer look like? Maybe you never had anybody teach on this. Today's a little more teaching than it is even a little bit preaching. But what does a balanced believer look like? And, uh, And there's a lot of things that we can talk about in this topic, but I want to quickly explore four areas that a lot of young believers get out of whack. Like we don't really understand the difference between some of these things. They cause a little bit of a struggle. Maybe you'll see yourself in some of these things. And so I'm going to briefly talk about four things that we have to keep in balance as a as a balanced believer. You want to be an experienced driver on the road trip and get to the next phase There are four things, right, causing your maturity to slow down. Uh, And uh, the first one is this, right? It's our understanding of the battle between the law of God and grace. And we're going to have a little bit of theology today. And I shared some of this. If if you didn't come, if you came to Wednesday night prayer and worship, you know that I talked a little bit about this, right? And as I was prepping, I thought that it fit really well. And so I'm going to go into it again. If you didn't come to prayer Um, We missed you, and we would love for you to be there. How many people were there Wednesday night? A lot of people in here. It's a wonderful night of acoustic worship and prayer. We do it every uh, every month, and it's a wonderful time. So I talked about this a little bit. Sometimes we get all caught up, guys, thinking that our salvation is based on our ability to do all of the right things and not do the wrong things. Anybody been there before? Like that that's what it's about, right? That I have to... I got to stop all the bad things and got to start doing all the right things. And when that happens, we we tend to live as though we can somehow be good enough to earn our salvation between us and God. Anybody know anybody like that out there? That's like thinking they can be good enough, just trying so hard. Look what it says in Romans 5, 20 to 21. Paul says this. It says God's law. This is why we have the law of God. It says God's law was given. <coughs> So that all people could see how sinful they really are. You get that? God gives us the law so that we have something to measure our lives up against. So we see how sinful we are. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So we have the law and we see how much we can't live up to it. And God's grace comes in. So just as sin ruled over all people 
and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The truth is a balanced disciple understands, guys, that the law of God, the Bible, the teachings of Jesus, the Old Testament, the New Testament exists to show us his standards and reveal to us that none of us can ever live up to all of it. You know that's true, right? No matter how hard you try, you can never live up to all of it. Here's the truth, guys. Without the law, there would be no breaking of the law. You get it? If there wasn't a law, there would be no breaking the law. Here's a great example. The speed limit is a great example of the law. How many of you just, we talk about drivers, you just ignore the speed limit. Anybody ignore the speed limit? <laughs> if the speed limit says 55, that's the law. 65? I'm up on 80. Well, I got, I got places to be. Listen, but, but if we didn't have the law... There would be no speeding. Everybody just drive however you want to drive. There would be no law to break. But because we have the law, the speed limit, 55, 65, now we got to speed, right? And that's the same thing with the law of God, right? Before there was any law laid down, there's nothing really for us to be sinning. And when you get pulled over for going 75 in a 55, how do you, how do you get saved? By the grace of an officer, who doesn't give you a ticket, right? That's grace. That's what happens. You deserve the ticket. But if you, you know, ladies, if you cry a little bit, you bat your eyelashes or whatever, and it's hope, hope that it's not a male cop, but it's a female cop, or it's not a female cop, it's a male cop, and you go, oh, officer, I, I didn't know. Okay, all right. <clears throat> a balanced disciple appreciates the law, and, and we need to appreciate the law of God. Jesus said, if you're my disciples, what? You'll obey my commands. So the law is there, right? We need to appreciate it, but we have to do our best, however, to know that it's only by grace that we're saved, right? And this is where a balanced believer understands that, that we need to understand the law, and we need to work and spend our lives, like, working to honor God. But at the end of the day, we're not saved by how good we get it, right? Because how many of you know if you break one law, you broke the law? Yes? Right. So when it comes to God's law, like I don't know about you, but I break the law every single day when it comes to me and God. I don't I don't break the I don't speed every day. Right. But I mean, we, I break God's heart every day. Like, am I the only one in here? Like we're human. There's no way for us to do it. That's why we needed grace. Everybody get what I'm talking about. So, number one, that's the thing that people get messed up. Number two, here's something that happens with us. Right. And we need to settle this, the battle between these two things, chasing perfection or pursuing holiness. Perfection versus holiness. How many people in here um, chase perfection, like you're perfectionist? Anybody, any self-admitted perfectionist? You get very bothered when things don't go the way you're hoping that they're going to go. Balanced believers understand that we're called to pursue holiness, which basically means that we're called to live our lives the best we can to be set apart. That's what holiness means, to be set apart from the world and set apart for God and for his purposes. That's holiness, right? But the reality is holiness is not the same as perfect because God's called us to, try, to strive to be holy, but he knows that we're never going to be perfect. God is the only one who is perfect. Jesus is the only one to ever walk the earth and live a perfect, sinless life. So while we need to work to be set apart the best that we can, we need to let go of the idea that we're going to be perfect, that we're going to get it right. In fact, check it out. Hebrews 4 says this, verse 14 and 15 says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Look at verse 15. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. So this is God. This is Jesus. He understands your weaknesses. He knows that you're not going to get it right. For he faced the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And so what does it say in response to that? So let's come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And what happens? There we will receive his mercy and we will find his grace. You get it? So God, his son Jesus was the only one that lived in perfection. And he knows that we're not going to be perfect. So what do we do? We go to him continually. We go with boldness, and we never forget that we can go to him and repent, and we can pursue holiness. See, chasing perfection, guys, is all about what other people think about us 
but pursuing holiness is about what God thinks about us. And so we have to win that battle. If you want to mature and you want to be a balanced believer, you need to keep that stuff straight. You need to know that, God, I'm never going to be perfect. And so I'm not going to let, and we're going to talk a little bit about how the enemy uses that against you. But I'm not going to be perfect, but I want to be set apart. And I want to be different. And so help me to do that. Everybody tracking where I'm at today? Makes sense? Okay, here's the third thing. If you want to be a balanced believer, if you want to become an experienced driver on the road trip, you need to settle the battle between faith and good works. Everybody get what I'm talking about? Faith and good works, right? So many young believers get stuck in this idea that it's our good deeds that put us in right standing with God. I used to say it this way all the time. Like, it doesn't matter how many old ladies you help walk across the street. You can't get to heaven because of that, right? And you should help old ladies across the street. But it's not about our good works, right? If there are so many people, you probably know somebody like this in your life, that they actually believe, they won't come to church, they won't surrender to Jesus, but they believe that if they're a good enough person, somehow St. Peter will let them in. They don't even understand that St. Peter has nothing to do with it, right? But somehow, somehow God will let them in, right? I don't know if my parents will watch this. Sometimes my parents watch the sermons and they tell me how wonderful I am. So mom and dad, I hope it's okay today. But my parents have a neighbor across the street. I, I wasn't sure I was going to say this, but like they have a neighbor across the street. He's retired, and uh, he's, he worked for a major, major worldwide corporation, made a lot of money, and uh, he's going through a lot of heart problems. In fact, even like a couple of months ago, he was out in his driveway in heart failure. If it wasn't for some neighbors that found him, called the ambulance, that would have been it, right? And so my dad's been going over and talking with him about like, where are you going? Because he's facing it, right? And he'll go over, and, and, and his neighbor will say, yeah, Carl, we're, I'm dying. And my dad will go, yeah, we're all dying. I mean, newsflash, right? The question is not, like, if you're dying, it's where are you going? And how can you know? Because you obviously God's given you opportunities to maybe get some things worked out. And you know what he always says? He says, you know, in my career, I raised a lot of money for all these charities. I did a lot of good stuff, and so I'm pretty good with what. You know. And how many of you know somebody like that? And I'm grateful for the example that my dad is in my life. He's persistent. Every time God opens up a door, he says, well, you just need to know how to make sure because it's not based on how much money you raise for charity. It's actually not based on anything good that you did. It's based on a relationship with Jesus. Here's how to pray it. I don't know if you now you don't want to pray it today, but I'm going to make sure you know how to pray it because you don't know when it'll be it. Right. And there's a lot of people out there that believe that our good deeds can save us from our sins. Look what Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says. It says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. That's what it says. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus to do the good things he planned for us long ago. See, mature believers... Experienced drivers on the road trip understand that we are saved by putting our faith in Jesus. It has nothing to do with how many good deeds you can do. It has nothing to do. That's why the, 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 you remember there were two murderers and rapists that hung next to Jesus on the cross. We like to call them thieves, but the reality is thieves didn't die like that. So they weren't like just petty thieves. They were they were people who society believed there was no chance of redeeming them, so they would be crucified to the right and the left of Jesus. You remember one of them, Kurt, was cursing Jesus and just dying that way. And the other guy had this interaction with Jesus where he said, like, if you're really the son of God, like I believe you are, then, you know, like, then save me, you know. Surely you're the son of God. And what did Jesus say to him? It was basically said, based on that confession that I'm the son of God, you're going to be where? With me in paradise. How many of you know that guy had no chance to get down off the cross and do enough good deeds to get his, himself into heaven? It was solely based on putting his faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he entered into eternity, and that's the way it is. And mature believers understand that. But how many of you know there's a balance between faith and good deeds, though? It doesn't mean that we don't have to do them. It just means that we're not saved by them. Check out James again. He said in, in chapter 2, verse 14 to 20, he gives us his whole discourse on faith and works and why it's important, but we're not saved by it. He said this, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? 
That kind of faith, can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and it's useless. You're not saved by your good deeds, but your good deeds show the faith that's working in your life. He goes on to say, now someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I'll show you my faith by my good deeds. And then I love this last one. You say you have faith, for I believe that there's only one God. How many of you know somebody who they believe there's a God, but, you know, they really haven't put their faith in him? And James says this, good for you. Even the demons believe this. Even Satan believes that there's one God. Good for you. And they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? So that's number three, guys. And we're not saved by our good deeds. Mature believers understand that. They have that balance that they understand. Like, I, I'm saved by faith in Jesus, but I have to have good deeds. Everybody still with me this morning? Here's the last one, and this is... This is the toughest one for a lot of people, and I'm going to take a little more time, and then we're going to move into some other practical stuff. The last thing we need to settle, if you want to be a mature follower of Jesus, right, if you want to be an experienced driver on the road trip, you need to settle the difference between condemnation and conviction. This is one that's really hard for a lot of Christians, condemnation and conviction, right? One of the things that keeps us from reaching our fullest potential as disciples of Jesus is getting caught up in condemnation rather than responding to conviction. They're two different things, right? And, and the reason this truth is, is so powerful is that both condemnation and conviction tend to handle a lot of the same issues in our lives. But um, there's a big difference between the two of them. One author explains it this way, and I thought it was really good. She said, conviction is about awareness. And the beauty of awareness is that it's the first step towards growth and change. That's conviction. Meanwhile, condemnation has guilt and punishment attached to it. And there is no wiggle room, no space to grow or change. There are only the consequences of our actions. Everybody get that? There's a difference between conviction. Paul said this in Romans chapter 8, 1 through 4. And it's important that we understand it. He said, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Anybody ever heard that before? Those of us that belong to Christ, there's no room for condemnation in our lives. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Look what he said. Remember we talked about the law. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like our bodies, the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And he did this so that the just requirement of the law could be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. So according to Paul, condemnation doesn't come from God. It's very different than conviction. In fact, there's no room for it in Christ Jesus. It's no, those of us that are followers of Christ. And if it doesn't come from God, then where does it come from? It comes from the enemy. It comes from the world. It comes from Satan. It comes, it's a real thing, and he's our real enemy. But listen, according to John 18, 8, this is what the Holy, Jesus said, this is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. It says when he comes, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin. That's what he does, right? And of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. See, while Satan brings condemnation into your life, Jesus brings conviction into our lives. Way different, right? And they're incredibly different. In fact, the, here are a few ways, guys, that you can tell. If you're not sure you can tell if something is in your life is condemnation or conviction, there's, a way, there's some ways that you can figure it out. So let's pick any sin, right? And, and you can pick your own, whatever your sin is. You don't have to raise your hand and tell me. But we can pick any sin, anything that you might battle in your life, in your flesh. So for today's purposes, I pick lying, okay? How many of you know lying is a sin, right? We're not supposed to lie, and we know that God isn't happy with that, right? We know it's not something that God desires. So through conviction, here's what the Holy Spirit says, okay? You lied, let's fix it. That's conviction, 
The Holy Spirit says you lied. You know you shouldn't do that. Let's fix it. Through condemnation, Satan says you lied. You're a liar. You guys get the difference in that? It's a major difference. You lied, and let's fix it. You lied, you're a liar. One of the things the devil does through condemnation is he wants to make your failures your identity. That is condemnation. That's what the enemy does in our lives. So he wants to say this. You lied, you're a liar. You cheated, you're a cheater. You stole, you're a thief, right? All of these things, that's condemnation. Yeah, was, is lying wrong? Is stealing wrong? Is cheating wrong? Yeah, all those things are wrong, and we know that, but he makes it your identity. Here's what the conviction of the Holy Spirit says about the same things. You lied, you're my child, I love you, let's fix it. Do you guys notice the difference in that? You're my child. That's your identity, right? The Holy Spirit says you stole, and that's not good, but you belong to me, so let's fix this. Let's make it right. You cheated, and I love you. Let's get back to where you belong because you belong to me, right? Another thing that condemnation does is it takes your sins and your mistakes, and it uses them to push you further down where you don't belong. Anybody get that? Anybody been there before? right, where you know you messed up, and what happens? You don't even want to come back to church. No? Because you feel condemnation. That's the enemy doing that, saying don't, don't go back there, right? Uh, Satan comes along, and he pushes you down, right? He says, you failed again. Anybody been there? You failed again, and you're never going to get it right. Why don't you stop pretending to actually be a follower of Jesus? I've been there before, right? He said, you, Satan says, you broke God's heart again. You stood up there last Sunday and you worshiped and you prayed and you asked God and you said you're never going to do it again. And here you are like three days after church and you're right back in the same spot. Why don't you stop going to church and stop pretending that you're something that you're not? Everybody get it? And while condemnation, this, if you don't know the difference, condemnation pushes you down. Here's what conviction does. Conviction pulls you back up towards God. You get the difference? It's a major difference. Same exact issues in your life. But condemnation says, get down. You're never going to be good. The Holy Spirit's conviction says, come up here with me where you belong. You get it? Right? Holy Spirit says, listen, you failed, right? But let me pick you back up because you're not a failure. I have something greater for you. I'm up here. You know you're separated from me because of this sin, but that's not where you belong. Come on back up here with me, right? You cheated, but let me forgive you and bring you back up here where you belong with me. You messed up big time, but listen, you're not defined by your failures. Mature Christians, experienced drivers, understand the difference, and it doesn't mean you're not going to feel condemnation if you're an experienced driver. You just know how to call the devil for what he is and be done with it and respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Amen? These are two different things, and they're important things for us to get right if we're going to be experienced drivers. See, the way we win the battle over condemnation is really easy, guys. We remember where it comes from, we remember the motivation behind it, and we remember what the end goal is, right? Condemnation, where does it come from? The enemy, right? What's the motivation behind it is to make your sins define you for who you are, and the end goal is to push you down and take you further away from your relationship with God. But conviction over the same exact things, where does it come from? It comes from God. The motivation is to remind you that this is not your identity. Yes, you messed up, but I want to help you make it right. And the end goal is to lift you out of that place and put you back in the right standing where God wants you. That's good preaching, right? This is what it means. This is how we determine the difference between those things. And it, we got to grab a hold of those things. I think one of the greatest biblical examples of the difference between condemnation and conviction can be seen in the death and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. There were two guys who betrayed Jesus that week. Judas and Peter. You get it? Two guys. Their sin against Jesus was not, one was not worse than the other, to be honest with you. I don't know if you knew this, but God doesn't rate your sins, some of them better or worse, right? You break the law, you break the law, right? He doesn't rate them. And so to Jesus, the sin of betrayal was just as painful with Judas as it was for Peter, right? But how many of you know how Judas' story played out? 
Remember Judas? He, he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. When he found out, right, when he found out that Jesus was actually going to die, he felt remorse. What did he do? He ran back to the chief priests, and he tried to give them back the 30 pieces of silver. He felt bad about it. He said, forget it. I don't want the money. It's, uh, you got what you needed. And remember how the Pharisees responded to him? They said, your guilt, that's not our problem. And they wouldn't even take the money back into the treasury because they knew it was blood money, right? And what happened to Judas? He was buried in condemnation, so he ran out and he took his own life. What happened to Peter? Remember Peter? He's the one always blabbing his mouth. Peter's always a big mouth, always the one saying, I don't care if everybody runs away. I won't run away. I'll die with you, Jesus, right? He was always, oh, I'm the big deal. I'm telling the, on the, on Peter on your profession that ch- I'm going to build my church, right? And then Jesus, two minutes later, he's like, get behind me, Satan. Peter was always the one running his mouth, telling everybody he was, had all the answers, right? He was a big mouth. And what happened? He said, Jesus, I'll never betray you. Even if everybody else runs away, I won't go. I'll die with you. And we know how his story played out. Three times God gave him a chance to honor that word. Three times he betrayed Jesus, the rooster crows. Peter runs and cries. His heart is broken. He's not even at the cross. He's not even there when Jesus died. So you know where he was. He was off hiding because he was ashamed of how he behaved. But what happened after Jesus was resurrected? We know Peter was one of the first ones to get there. What happened when Peter sat, stood on the beach with Jesus while he was cooking him breakfast? And what did he do? He came to Jesus. And Jesus said, do you love me three times? Then feed my sheep. And what's the difference between Judas and Peter? Because Peter, Judas was full of condemnation, and he lost his life over it. Peter was full of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And what happened? Jesus restored him, lifted him back up, and still fulfilled the mission that he had for him, still allowed him to. The church to be built on the profession of faith. Guys, these are the differences between conviction and condemnation. Jesus restored him. Some of us are here today in this room probably, and we want to get to that place of maturity. We want to become experienced drivers, but maybe there are some things that we're still caught up in, right? Like maybe you're still trying to follow all the rules instead of embracing his grace. Maybe you're too busy trying to be perfect When all God wants from you is a a sincere attempt day in and day out to be set apart. He knows you're not going to be perfect. And that that constant attempt at perfection is keeping you from getting to that place in your walk. Maybe you're so concerned with doing good deeds that you've forgotten that it's more about faith. Right? It's more about your faith in Jesus. And worst of all, like a lot of people, maybe you're here today and you get bogged down in condemnation. When really the Holy Spirit is just trying to convict you. He wants to deal with the same things. But he's not trying to identify you as anything other than his child. And he wants to bring you up. Now if you guys, if you see yourself on the, in these situations and you want to get to the next place on the road trip, I have some steps for you. And here's where we're going to get practical. And then we're going to land this plane today and we're going to let you get home and watch the Super Bowl and see what team wins and who cares. Okay, except for the Chiefs. Sorry, Tony. So let me put it this way, guys. If you want to... Get on to the, everybody still with me? We're good? If you want to get on to the next place in your spiritual road trip, I would put it this way. If you want to be a balanced believer, then plug into a balanced church. This is very practical. You got to plug in. You got to be somewhere where you're going to become balanced. Way back in 2010 when we started Searchlight, our desire was this, to build an authentic community of people committed to living like Jesus lived and loving like Jesus loves. That was our statement. That is what we wanted it to be. When there was only 15 people in my living room before we had a big place to meet and all this wonderful stuff that God's blessed us with, we said we just want to be a committed, we want to be a, 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 an authentic community, like real people, so it's regular people, right, that are committed to living like Jesus lives and loving like Jesus loves. That's basically it, all sewn up in that little statement. And when it comes to having a balanced church, the greatest example we can follow is found in the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts, that's the first century church. The book of Acts, we can see that. And one of the things I love about the book of Acts is that even though there's a set amount of chapters, like when you read the book of Acts, it ends, right? But the truth is the the events of the book of Acts never stopped with the end of the writing of the book of Acts. In fact, Searchlight Church, you are part of a church right now That is just a continuing work of what God started in the book of Acts with the day of Pentecost. It didn't end. I don't know if you knew that or not. 
but it didn't end. All of the things that God was doing in the book of Acts, I believe he is still doing today in 2024. He still called us to go out and be his disciple and to make disciples and preach the gospel and share his message all across across the globe. Right. And in Acts chapter two, 42 to 47, we get the best description of what a healthy, balanced church looks like. And how many of you know that when you get off track in your life? The best thing you can do is go back to the basics that got you where you were. Everybody get that? You ever get off track? in something in your life, and you go, how, do I, how did I get so far off track? Go back to the things, right? Like if you're off track in your diet, and it's February, and you're already messed up, and you already blew all your uh, resolutions that you made just six weeks ago, nobody else is there. I had five slices of pizza yesterday. <laughs> if you're off track, what do you do? You go back to the basics, Right? You don't kill yourself. You say, you know, tomorrow I'm going to eat a little better and I'm going to take a walk and I'm going to get back to the basics. A- amen, anybody, right? And that's what we do. And so we got to go back to the basics. A first century church right after Jesus um, was resurrected. He walked on the earth for 40 days and then he ascended into heaven. And then we start seeing the, the move of the Holy Spirit and the church was born. Remember, Peter preached and 3,000 people got saved. And all of a sudden they needed to gather everybody. And that's how the church started. We go back to Acts chapter 2, we can get a picture of what a healthy, balanced church is supposed to look like. Check it out. It says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. This is what a church should look like. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, All the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple every day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, listen to this, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That is the picture of a balanced, healthy church in 2024. It's not just the book of Acts. It's what should be happening in the church today, right? It's what it looked like in the beginning shortly after Jesus lived. But for the last 2,000 years, the church has in many ways deviated from those things. How many of you have been part of a church that doesn't look anything like that? Yes? I have been, right? And there are a lot of churches that are way off, ba- off track, right? And if you want to be a balanced believer, you got to be plugged in to a balanced church, right? And so here's what the church should look like. And I'm going to give you three things really fast. And we'll talk a little bit about search life for a second. A balanced church is this, a healthy church with healthy people. A balanced church is a healthy church with healthy people. In other words, a healthy church should have a combination, right? Now, it's... It, If a church is actually doing the work of God, we know that there are going to be people at every phase of the road trip in church. And today, there are people in our church that maybe aren't really as healthy as they should be in their spiritual walk, or they're just starting out, and there are people who have been doing this for a long time. Here's what a healthy church should look like. There should be unsaved people attending because they're looking for answers. Yes? You walked into church maybe one day, you were unsaved, and you were looking for answers. Right. A healthy church should be full of brand new followers of Jesus who are still learning the basics. A healthy church should have people who have a lot of maturing to do along the journey. And a healthy church should have seasoned, mature disciples of Jesus who are there to mentor more people along the way. That's what a healthy church should look like. But if you want to be a healthy, balanced believer, guys, you need to be around other healthy, balanced believers who are further down the road than you are in your walk, right? And when we look at the church in the book of Acts, obviously there were people there that were in need because it says they were selling excess stuff and giving the money to help make sure everybody had what they needed. But they were also listening to the apostles' teaching, and they were learning what it meant to follow Jesus. So that we know that there were people in need, and then there were mature believers that were teaching other people. And thankfully here at Searchlight, We have some wonderfully mature people that you can get alongside of and live life with them. Amen? And that's a healthy church. And I I don't know if you knew this or not, but if you want to get healthy, 
don't hang out with everybody that's going to Taco Bell every day at 11 o'clock at night. No? I love Taco Bell. I don't love what it does to my bowels. Too much? TMI? But if I'm trying to be healthy, I don't hang out with my friends that like Taco Bell. I have to hang out with my friends that eat fruit and nuts and berries and stuff that's not enjoyable. But it's healthy for you, right? If you want to be healthy, get with the people. Get next to some people that are healthy. Amen? Get next to some people that are going in the right direction. Secondly, a balanced church is this, a church with purpose. A balanced church is a church that has purpose, right? If we go back and read Acts 2, 42 to 47, there are five things that were happening in the church. And you have to be part of a church with purpose, right? And sadly, a lot of churches are not working with purpose. They're just working for survival. But you got to be part of a church that's doing things on purpose. And there are five things really quickly, and they're not in your notes, but I'll just throw them out there. There are five things that were happening in the early church, and they need to be happening. If you, if ever in Searchlight they're not happening, come and talk to me, and we'll figure it out, right? But we, they're, they're important. Number one, first, they were, they were having acts of worship. There has to be worship going on. They met together every day and in each other's homes to worship and to praise God. Secondly, there was prayer. They had corporate prayer where they prayed together, and there was also a commitment to personal prayer. Third, there was discipleship going on. At a healthy, balanced church, there will be discipleship happening, right, where people have a way to grow in their faith. It says they they listened to the apostles teaching and preaching, and then there were actions that followed that, right? Fourth, there was outreach. It says that God was adding to their number every day. That means that they were out there in the public square. They were loving on people, and they were sharing the word of God with people, and they were making sure that if there were people that had needs, they were getting met. And also, and and, and God was adding to their number. And lastly, they were there was serving. There was serving happening in the local church. Right? It says they opened up their homes to each other. Remember, it says they met each with with each other in their homes. That means they were serving each other. They were preparing meals for each other and for outsiders. And it says that they celebrated the Lord's Supper. And, and that they didn't order from Amazon communion cups like we do. That means that they had to set a table and prepare something to drink and some bread to break together, right? And so they were celebrating those things. I'm so thankful, guys, that Searchlight Church is a place where we're committed to those five things in our church. We're committed to worship. We're committed to prayer. We're committed to serving and outreach. We're committed to discipleship, guys. And if you want to be a balanced experienced driver. Everybody still with me? If you want to be that, you can't just attend. you got to plug in. you got to plug in if you want to be ex- an experienced driver. And here's the last one, the third item. A healthy church is a church with a plan. It's not just going to happen by accident. In this crazy world we live in, guys, with so many things that are pulling for your attention, for my attention, looking to grab your attention, pull you away from what's important, we know that's where we live. And so we've based our entire paradigm of our church on three very simple things like a plan my desire is guys that every single person that wants to be a mature believer right like you're not you don't want to be an in-betweener anymore you don't want to just be a new driver or a brand new first-time car owner you want to be an experienced growing follower of Jesus that there's three simple things that we want everybody to do and I know this part of it may seem like a infomercial for searchlight but guys it's practical Because I believe in this so much. So many of you are newer to Searchlight. You wouldn't even know that these three things are so important to us as a church. 100%. First thing is make Sunday morning a priority. And it's not, I don't have it there for you to fill in, but I'm just going over it. What would happen if 100% of the people that believed Searchlight was their church and they wanted, they were serious about becoming an experienced follower of Jesus made that commitment to be in church every Sunday. Guys, I know you're not, we're not going to get it perfect, and it's not about good works, right? But if you really want to be healthy and balanced, it starts with worshiping together. It is possible to grow a little bit as a Christian sitting at home watching Stephen Furtick or T.D. Jakes or Joyce Meyer or Joel, maybe Joel Osteen. I don't know. I mean, it's possible. Sorry, I didn't mean to slam Joel Osteen. It's, he has some good stuff, right? But it's possible to do that. But how many of you know that you do not really begin to grow until you show up at church and have to rub shoulders with other Christians? No? Because the minute you show up in church and somebody told your, stole your parking spot that you thought was yours, 
Now you got to deal with some of those emotions, right? This is how we grow and it's how we mature, right? Maybe your view of Sunday morning is that it's something you don't necessarily need for growth, but I can guarantee you that on any given Sunday, there are others who will benefit from your smile, from your hug, from your confident words. So maybe you feel like you can grow, but I don't know if you knew that, but there are a lot of other people here that need to see your face in church. Yes? They need to see you, and it's about community, okay? And if you want to be balanced, you got to be here. Second thing, it, it, how powerful would it be if 100% of our people here were involved and plugged in in a life group? Sunday mornings and life groups. Sundays are wonderful, right? I don't know about you, but every Sunday morning, I leave here feeling encouraged, and I'm excited for what God's doing, and I love to sing, and I love to hear everybody else that leads worship, and, I, and I'm encouraged. I love to hear the preaching, and I love to see everybody's smiling faces, right? But the reality is on any given Sunday morning, I might say hi to 120, 130 people, but I probably only have three or four really good conversations. Yes? Where I really am dialed in and I get a chance to talk to somebody about what's going on in their lives. See, we believe that you can't do life alone. And, and all those are there, although there's a great amount of learning that happens when we sit in rows like this, you're really not going to grow to your fullest, most mature potential as a follower of Jesus until you get in circles with some other people. Yes? How many people have been in at least one life group in your time at Searchlight? Put your hand up. All through this room, there's a lot of people that have been in a life group. And how many of you would admit that you, your growth spiritually took leaps and bounds when you got in a circle with other people? It's how it happens, right, guys? And so two things. Come, you want to be an experienced driver on your spiritual road trip? you got to come on Sundays because that's where you're going to get encouraged and pumped up and excited, right? That's the place where most likely you can invite some friends. But then you got to get into a life group. you got to make it a priority. And here's the third thing, and Tim hit it last week a little bit. It's getting on a serve team. Getting on a serve team. There are three. If we could get everybody to do these three things, everything else will fall into place in your life. Number one, come on Sunday. Number two, get in a life group. And number three, get on a serve team. Here's the truth, guys. You are never more like Jesus than when you're serving other people. If you want to live in love like Jesus, serve. You're never more like him than when you're serving. I could go around this room today. We don't have time. And Tim took my phone to run the cameras, so I don't have my timer. So I'm sorry. I don't know how long I've been talking, but we're going to get you out of here. Okay? I could go around the room, though, if I had time, and ask people to tell me if they met some of their best friends in church on serve teams. Yes? That they came to church, they loved it, they learned the word, but their life changed when they, had to, when they learned how to serve next to somebody and they became connected. Time and time again, I've seen, I've seen serve team members praying for each other one-on-one, -on -one, crying together, laughing together, hugging each other, celebrating. I've, I've seen serve team members calling other team members when they haven't seen them in, a church, in, in church in a while saying, hey, I haven't greeted with you in a while. Is everything okay? I want to make sure. You guys get what I'm talking about? It changes when you get on a serve team. The best way I can put it is this. When you step into a serve team, you are guaranteed to meet some amazing people, to fulfill God's design for your life, and experience some of the greatest blessings that God has for you. You will never hear me say, please join the nursery because we need help in there. You will never hear me say that because, listen, guys, I don't believe God begs us to do anything. You get what I'm talking about? God doesn't beg. He's God. <laughs> God doesn't beg. He doesn't beg for your money. He doesn't beg for your time. He doesn't beg for any of it. You know what God does? He says, let me give you an opportunity for me to change your life by going over there and serving. And I will never beg anyone to give their time or their energy or serve. All I will say was if you're serious about becoming an experienced driver, if you're serious about stepping into the next realm of your spiritual walk, let me give you an opportunity to get there. And it's going to be standing at that door and saying good morning once a month. It'll be coming out here and helping to set up for the cafe once in a while. It'll be being in there and loving on babies once a month so that parents can come in here and become experienced. You get what I'm talking about? I don't, I'm not going to beg you to do that because if you don't serve, you're just missing out. You're just missing out on an opportunity for God to take you to the next level. Anybody amen, right? This is good stuff. So three things for everybody to do. If you want to be a balanced believer, you got to be in a balanced church. 
right? And that's a healthy church with healthy people, a church with a purpose, and a church with a plan. And that's the plan. It's really easy. You're not going to find all kinds of other things here at Searchlight. And so as I bring this to an end and, uh, and I land this thing, I want to deal with two questions we all need to answer. And then just a couple films and we're going to go home. Two questions that you and I need to answer. We always have to come back to this place. And here's the first one, guys. What happens in my life if I choose to be plugged in to a healthy church? What are the things that will happen in my life if I choose to be plugged in? And I'm, now I'm going to give you the answer to the question. Here's the answer. You're going to grow in your faith. You're going to move further down the road in your spiritual road trip. You're going to become a balanced, healthy disciple. You're going to serve in ways that you never imagined. God's going to open up doors and take you into new things that you never imagined. And you are going to be a blessing to others simply because of your presence. If you choose to plug in and be here on Sunday and get in a life group and get on a serve team, all these things are going to happen. That's question number one. And this is the more serious question. What happens in my life if I choose to do life alone? That's the other question that we have to answer. What happens in my life if I choose to do life alone? The truth is, guys, the devil wants you isolated and he wants you alone. That is why when you're discouraged and you're depressed and you're hurting and you feel like a failure and you're bogged down in condemnation, you don't get up and want to go to church. Do you get that? You want to stay home. Anybody been there? Just me? You want to stay home. You don't want to go there because you're going to see other smiling people and want to punch somebody in the face. And you know that that's not the Holy Spirit. That's the devil. So you just want to stay home because you don't be around all those happy people because you're not happy. And when if you choose to live life alone, that is ultimately what happens. Right. The last thing the enemy wants is you to find love and support and care and be in an environment where the Holy Spirit can lift you out of that. He wants you alone. And that's why the first thing when we're hurting is we stay away. It's the first thing we do. And so when he sweeps in with things like that, like you're never going to be good enough, we just want to stay home. Where everyone else has it all together, but you obviously don't, we want to be isolated, right? And that's when condemnation creeps in and begins to tell you that your identity is anything but what the Holy Spirit says your identity is. So right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, in fact, let's stand up. We're going to gather our things and and get ready to go home today. But just stand with me, and I want you to just kind of close yourself in with the Lord for a moment. We're going to get you out of here. But if you're here this morning and you take a look at your identity, you take a look at where you're at on the spiritual road trip that you're on, and if you see yourself in one of these things that I talked about, I don't know, you know, if you feel the Holy Spirit's tap you on the shoulder a little bit, and you see yourself there, maybe you're here and you look at your spiritual road trip and you find that you're not in the most healthy, balanced place in your walk with God. You find that maybe you're further behind than you wanted to be. And you say, okay, I feel God talking to me. Like, I don't want to be an in-betweener anymore. I want to get to the next place in this road trip, right? Maybe you see yourself here today and you're losing the battle between law and grace. Like, you're, you're, you're wrapped up in trying to get it all right. Maybe you're losing the battle between good works and faith. Or you're trying so hard to be perfect and you're missing the mark when all he's really called you to is to do your best to be set apart a little bit. Or maybe worst of all, you're really, really bound up in condemnation and the Holy Spirit's trying to lift you out of that with conviction. Because the word says it's your kindness that leads me to repentance. It's your kindness It's your love for me. It's your gentle conviction that says, come back to what I have for you. If you answer yes to any of those things today, would you just slip up your hand this morning? I don't know who's here today. Thank you guys for being honest. A lot of hands up here in the room. You can just keep them up for a minute so I can see, man, tons and tons of us here that find ourselves in that place. We want to go further on the road trip. You can put them down. I want to pray for you guys this morning. Listen, my hand is up because I'm in the same boat. I don't know if you knew this, but sometimes pastors are not where they want to be on their spiritual road trip either. And I want to be more like Jesus tomorrow than I was today. And I want to let go of perfectionism and do my best just to pursue holiness and let him separate me from everything else. I got to work on that stuff too. And so let me pray for you today. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit 
brings peace into your life and into your heart right now as I wrap it up. Lord, thank you for my friends in this room. Lord, we want to be experienced drivers on the road trip. We want to drive every lap of our road trip with purpose. We want to become everything that you've called us to be. So, Lord, whatever the issue is for everybody that raised their hand, I don't know and I don't need to know. But, Lord, you know what it is. And so, God, we confess it to you and we respond to your Holy Spirit today. And, God, lift us up out of the stuff that we're in. Bring us up to where you want us to be. And, God, help us as a church to be healthy and balanced and become everything that you've called us to be. Help us to reach and teach people to live in love like your son, Jesus. And Lord, bring us back next Sunday as we talk about the last phase of our spiritual road trip, a place that all of us can strive to be in our lives between now and when we enter into eternity with you. And God, be with us as we go today. Help us to become what you've called us to be. And Lord, may your will be done in the Super Bowl today. And we know that you don't even care that much about it. But let it be a great night of family and friendship and fellowship, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen. Hey, guys, God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday for the wrap-up. Hey, thanks for that practical message, Pastor Chris. We are so excited for people getting out of rows and into circles. I hope if you're not in a life group, you'll sign up today. Head to our website, searchlightchurch.com, click on the life group tab, and you can go ahead and select the life group you'd like to be in. Don't miss the opportunity to be a part of community. Thanks for watching, guys. Leave us a like, leave us a comment. If you're watching this live, go your favorite football team. Have a great day.